All right, we're live today. And um, this is Joy Lachere and, oops, my screen has moved. Give me just a moment here. There we go. <laughs> and I'm your host today on Matured Musicians uh, Group. And we are about to start an interview with Michelle and Leah Moore McNannell. And before we do that, I do have um, a message uh, and, and, and an ad here for Luscious Moss Studios, which is owned and operated out of Edgewood, Washington by Chad Christ. And uh, he has created an environment for particularly for drummers and musicians, um, guitar players, that's um, both relaxing and collaborative and creative. It, it stimulates creativity. So if you get a chance, uh, give him a call. He's on the Facebook and under Luscious Moss Studio. With that, I want to welcome <laughs> Michelle uh, D'Amour McDonald. I hope I'm mm -hmm. not Okay. Oh, you can just go by Michelle Demore, my stage name. I don't usually use the other name okay. for music. All right. Michelle Demore, it is. <laughs> so I've been wait, anxiously waiting. You're getting uh, um, uh, some response from my people and uh, the people that are here. I hope you told your friends that you're going to be on. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's one of the first questions um, I asked my guests. Uh, is how you got into music. What was your first instrument or, or maybe this first song you wrote or how did this all come about, Ms. Sheldon Moore? Uh, well, um, I was one of those kids who, you know, like even as a little baby would like, you know, boogie to music in the, in the grocery <laughs> store, according to my mom. Um, and both my parents really loved music. So there was music playing in the house. My dad had a huge record collection. Um, with a lot of different kinds of music. So I actually started playing the piano when I was about five. Wow. Um, and um, th there's a story there, which is that um, um, I started playing uh, some stuff by ear. So I was hearing stuff on the radio, hearing stuff on TV and playing it by ear. And my parents said, oh my gosh, you know, this is amazing. We have to sign her up for, for piano lessons. And I really wanted to play like blues and jazz and boogie woogie kind of stuff uh -huh. at that time. But I didn't really know what it was called, right? So I just, so I was like, oh, okay. So they signed me up with this incredibly intense piano teacher who was wow. um, basically teaching like future concert pianists. And that was not at all what I wanted to do. And she required you to play um, classical music only um, uh, and study classical music for five years before you yeah. could do anything else. And I just, I made it for about three and a half years and she was just so strict and kind of sucked the fun out of it yeah. that I, that I did after that point. Um, but it was a good foundation. I still do, you know, remember a lot of it and, you know, mess around on, on keys here and there. Um, and then right around that same time when I was six, um, I wrote my first song, which was a blues song, um, heavily influenced by uh, my dad's record collection. I wrote this song called My Mom is So Mean. <laughs> and I'd say about 98% of the population can relate because at some point you had that thought about your mom. Um, yeah. And the other 2% were like, no, my mom was a saint. Um, <laughs> my mom wasn't a saint. I don't know about those, I don't know about those people. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I wrote, and my dad thought it was hilarious. And it was very much just like, na, 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 na. My mom is so mean, you know, kind of a thing. And I, love it. I still have the lyrics to that written in like, purple pencil um yeah <laughs> my lyrics are much better now i'm happy to say <laughs> yes <laughs> they're pretty good yeah oh yeah i think we all go through that rebellious period we want to be independent but we aren't <laughs> yeah yeah we're, and not even ready the age, yeah we're not ready for it yeah <laughs> yeah so when you um when you started playing and you wrote this song, did you get any airplay on this song at all? Did you sing it anywhere or? <laughs> yeah, I was six years old. No, no. Um, I, I think I learned after the first time that I, I was heard singing it around the house that singing it again would not be a good idea. <laughs> so, so no, no. Can yeah. I kind of tabled that for a while. 
tabled that for a while. Um, dad thought it was, for the record, dad thought it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mom did not think it was hilarious. It was. So, uh, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. I get yeah. it. Um, what was a well? What did where did you go from there? Did you go into any high uh, grade school and then eventually high school? Uh, yeah, you're shaking your head. Yeah. Good. Tell us uh, about so that. I I did school choir. I did church choir. Um, of course, of course, right? How stereotypical blues singer who sings in the church choir. Uh, I did the church choir for more than 10 years. Um, and then I did some kind of like garage bandish kind of stuff nobody would have heard of. Um, and then in the early 2000s, I started going to blues jams. And what, um, what year? Really what, loving year? That. what was the year? Uh, what was that? What year did you start going to blues jams? Uh, early 2000s. Yeah. Oh, so I was, yeah, yeah. Um, so like 20 some years ago, um, and just got, just met all these great people and learned a ton because I feel like at a blues jam as the singer, particularly, or the person who's supposed to be, you know, controlling and going, okay, you solo now, uh, which is what, of course, a, a band leader does, um, you learn a lot and you learn, I think more from the stuff that is a total complete train wreck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. learning okay. doesn't work. You know, like if you're up there and everything move, goes smoothly, you can learn about you know what goes smoothly. But when something just absolutely doesn't work, you learn a ton. So it was a good education. And through that, I made a bunch of contacts who kept saying to me, "You need to have a band." Yeah. So I eventually I did that. Yeah, yeah. You know that sounds a lot like. Right. Right because that's how I got started too and I got started I got my band put together in 2000 yep and yeah I might and the people that I was I jammed with like 35 bands before I ever you know I, I go to every jam every place there was one until uh somebody finally said from the audience there were two ladies and they say you need to start your own band <laughs> and there it began <laughs> you yep. get it right so and then you're off and of your, <laughs> yes speaking of your band i noticed that you had some brass in there what do you all have how many people do you have in, in the band ah well it actually um we have what i call the core band so the so short answer is the band sort of can, expands and contracts depending <laughs> on yeah. The stage size, the budget, you know, that kind of thing. So, for instance, yeah. we just did a show um, September uh, or sorry, on Saturday that was three was a trio. So it was guitar, oh, vocals and bass. And that's it. So that's the smallest configuration that we'll do. Um, the core band is, of course, the, the four piece. So guitar, vocals, bass, drums. And then we will often add uh, keyboards and saxophone. Um wow. Sometimes we add also a trombone and a trumpet. Um, so, so yeah, it's like that's the band, you know, plus horn section kind of, you know, situation. So it really, it just really depends on what the vibe we're kind of going for as well. So a lot of times for festivals, I'll try to get the six piece out there because then there's material we can cover that yeah. we wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have the keys or the sax. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was listening to some of the stuff that you did, of course, and I, I think I've mentioned that before. And I'm just, I, I just am in love with your voice. I think you're great. And around here, up in the North End, I live in Redmond, and the, the people around here are really into the blues. I mean, this is mm -hmm. a blues area in Seattle, too. And um, I went to this place. Oh, God, I hope Tommy Wall isn't listening. <laughs> but I went to this place called Raging Roofer in, in North Bend, not North Bend, um, Fall City. Yep. And because it was the closest jam to Redmond, I'd never been there before. And these people were all blues people. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, I, and I, I, um, oh, I learned so a ton from Tommy. I used to go to that one a lot as well. Yeah. Did you? Oh, for him. Yeah. I felt so yeah. intimidated. And the, for the longest time, I would never go back. And for the longest time, I felt just, yeah, I never got up to sing. But um, 
eventually the guy that was running that, Tommy Wall, uh, the the bass player, Tommy Wall, I don't know if you know him, mm -hmm. but he, yep. he started a place at Flanagan's, I believe it is, up in... Uh, oh, in Finati's or Finati's yeah, or whatever. Yeah. In Snoqualmie, yeah, because yeah, they're not doing live music at the at the Raging River anymore. Yeah, yeah. And then I realized because he was like really nervous, like country music. Oh my God, what is one of the chords? <laughs> so anyway, uh, after that, I realized he actually does know country music. His dad's a fan, and now while he yeah. kind of moved more to the blues, he could do country. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I learned a lesson about making judgments. <laughs> you know, my dad loved country music too, and it is absolutely not my thing. Um, and we used to have this little joke because I would say to him, dad, you know, I don't know what country it's from, but it's not mine. Um, <laughs> and we would laugh. Because um, my dad and I kind of had that thing, you know, where we would tease each other a lot. Um but one of the, the the songwriters that he used to listen to a lot, who I really admire, is Roger Miller. And yeah. I really, as a kid, I listened to the, the music and the way that Roger Miller told the story and he painted the picture yes. of what he was talking about. And I would say that's that's an influence for me, yes. um, even though I don't think it's, you know, it's not quite my thing. But <laughs> I do yeah. love Roger Miller. I know, and he he do when he forget the words, he go do 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 do. <laughs> yep. Just yep. Pick it up. So we have a listener here, and they say hello, ladies. I'm listening. Haven't identified themselves, but I guess if I had to flip a coin, it could be Raymond Hayden. I don't know if you know him. His yeah. wife is uh, Jessica Lynn Whitty, and she is a fantastic country singer. So uh, I. I, I am not really into the traditional country, but I had to learn it. Oops, Tommy here. Oh my God, that's not Tommy Wall. Are you Tommy ah. Wall? <laughs> 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 I think he already knows this story, but anyway. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I don't know where I was. Am I getting old? I forgot where I was. <laughs> anyway, story. He blew my mind when he said Tommy. <laughs> And then this person says, hi, senorita. I'm not sure uh, which senorita he's talking about. <laughs> and so I'll take after, it. <laughs> <laughs> I like Spanish music. I, I, I'm not capable, I don't think. But um, there's some really beautiful stuff out there. Yes, indeed. So when, what year did you actually put your band together? And who were your players? And, and who did you... Mm. Who did you uh, decide was going to be your support? Oh, wow. The band's been through a bunch of different iterations. Um, our first drummer was Rick Bowen um, because he was one of the biggest, uh, you know, biggest uh, encouragers saying I should start a band. And I said, well, fine, then be my drummer. And he said, OK, so <laughs> that's how you recruit people. Um, um, <laughs> So Rick Bowen was our drummer. And then um, I tend to like stuff that's really funky. So I, I actually do play bass. Um, ah, okay. I tend to like stuff that's really funky, though, that's hard to sing and play at the same time. So um, I recruited Patrick McDaniel to be my bass player. And the funny story there is he and I had been friends for years. I think we met in the early 2000s. We would see, I would see him all the time. I'd go, you know, to various festivals or various, you know, bands shows. And I would see him cause he, you know, he substitutes for a lot of different bands. And um, so I asked, so we were friends, you know, we would see each other. And so I asked him if he would be my bass player and he said, yeah. And sort of around the same time that the band was being formed uh, he and I started to date so, um, so then we actually got married um, in 2012. So um, he always joked that he should have looked at the fine print in the contract. <laughs> <laughs> so he's the only original member of the band along with me. Um, and then let me think here. Um, early on in the very, very early stages of the band, we had um, Doug Kearney playing guitar. Um, and uh, C.D. Woodbury was our kind of backup guitarist, um, but he actually never ended up playing with us other than as a sub a few times over the years, but they're both wonderful. Um, 
And then, so now the current iteration of the band is me, um, Patrick on bass. We have Carl Martin on drums. We have um, a brand new guitarist just starting up with us named Richard Newman, who's fantastic. Um, he grew up in, uh, or he was born in New Orleans, grew, grew up in Memphis. So he's wow. um, got slide guitar and, and that stuff that I really love. So that opens up um, room for us to do some really interesting stuff, which is great because we are working on another album. Um, and then Brian Ohlendorf is our regular key keyboard player and Noel Barnes is our sax player and we love them both. Mm. So how many albums do you have? Uh, like six. One or more? Oh my gosh. Since 2000, you have six albums. You are a um, one working girl. 2000, 2000, uh, 2012, late, wow. late 2011, early 2012 is when the band was formed. And so we've done six albums. Yeah. Wow. And one of them is a Christmas album with uh, eight original blues Christmas songs. Wow. Or I have to listen to that one. I didn't catch that one. Oh, by the way, yeah. the uh, person here, she said, Rita, Senoritas, <laughs> plural. And his, his initials are TW. That sound kind of suspicious. <laughs> it's just a little. <laughs> Tommy Wall. <laughs> hey. So what um, what is it? about your music i mean i can hear it but i'm not sure exactly what it is but what makes your music um what i would consider a little bit more unique than than some of the blues around here i don't know if they're playing older blues tunes and of course i don't know anything about blues so to speak i mean uh i hear it and they play it but i'm not really sure it, the the history of the blues so what makes yours yeah. so unique um, I would say from a musical standpoint, um, it's uh, a lot of it is Patrick's bass lines because, you know, I write, I write the bass lines and then he 90% of the time changes them. I have to give him credit. Um, so I'll start, so I'll write a bass line and then he'll be like, yeah, okay, fine. And then he, you know, makes it more funky. Um, so that's an integral part of the band sound that is consistent, you know, through all of the years and all of the albums. Um, we try, you know, we don't just stick to 12 bar blues. So we'll, we'll do interesting chord changes. We'll do, um, you know, a lot of the guys in the band are, um, have some background in jazz or other things like that. So mm -hmm. they like to uh, mix it up as, as far as that goes, you know, I say, Hey, let's have a bridge here or let's do you know let's go to the raised five or something like that so as we're working on songs um that happens a lot and of course since i've been working with the same people for a long time i'm a lot of times writing stuff with them in mind and so um i will write the lyrics and the melody and the bass line and then you know we'll do a scratch recording and then we'll take it into the rest of the band and i'll go to the guitar player and say i'm hearing something like this you know, and I'll kind of sing a, a, a guitar line to him. So, or I'll sing something to the keyboard player or the, the, the sax player. And then they kind of take it from there and, and run with it and, you know, add their, their touches to it. So, um, and then I would say lyrically, um, because I have very early training as a poet, um, my lyrics are probably a little different from what you would hear in, traditional blues. And, and that's, I think, a good thing because I think people should write from their own experience. And right. by talking about your own experience, you get to something that other people can relate to. So instead I of trying a, to be someone. You, yeah, exactly. You know. I, I got another comment here from a listener. Uh, I, I had him on, I believe it was last week, Mark Peterson. Mm -hmm. And he said, love country and blues, enjoying your guests. So <laughs> so my mark <laughs> very, cool. For very cool <laughs> yeah so uh, i know that you wrote this in your bio and i read it about you being mm -hmm. the poetress of blues uh oh. so and and you talk about how did you get that title and what was your training in poetry uh i know uh, yeah you mentioned it, so um so from a very early age in addition to, to playing the piano and writing the song about how mean my mom was. I was also writing poems when I was really young. And um, I took a bunch of poetry classes when I was at 
the University of Washington. Go Huskies! <laughs> um, and uh, took a bunch of poetry classes and actually was published as a poet, I think, when I was 18 or 19. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that's really, really good training because a lot of what you learn in poetry classes is um, not just, you know, the forms and the, the meter and that kind of stuff, which is important for songwriting, but also um, what words are important to telling the story and what words are not. Um, and so um, one of the things that people all used to say to me when I was reading my poetry back in college, you know, we do poetry readings because we're super hip mm -hmm. like that. Um, is they say your po your your poems sound like lyrics, like they sound musical. So ah. the the two exist in my brain in 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 the same place. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Nora Michaels, I don't know if you ever heard of or or had the privilege of meeting Nora, but Nora Michaels was um, she just passed away um, a little bit more than a year ago. But she was she actually sang backup on a couple of our tunes on um, on one album. Um, and she, it was delightful. And she was a huge part of the music scene in Seattle in the eighties. She was a songwriter. Um, she could sing Edith Piaf, like nobody's business. She was just wonderful. And it's Nora who calls, called me the poetess of the blues. Ah, okay. So, yeah. I, I have my uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter, just to write poetry to me and send it. You know, she she would send it to me when she was gone. And today she can't remember any of that. And I never learned poetry, but I sang a lot. And so uh, I think that just listening to the country songs, eventually that kind of comes second nature. It's like inherent, just in, like in your music, because you knew music and you're doing music that carried through to your poetry. That's interesting because mm -hmm. I didn't realize there was a meter to poetry. Oh yeah, well, some of it is. I mean, I think in, in more modern times, you, you see a lot of stuff that's called free verse, right? Where there's no mm -hmm. rhyme pattern and there's no um, rhythm pattern. But uh -huh. when I studied poetry, I learned forms that had a rhyme pattern and a rhythm pattern and so you actually had to pay attention to how the words were falling out um mm. super good training super good discipline yeah sounds like it i think i missed some things in my training <laughs> and i'm nowhere near the singer you are but i uh you know i, I got my own thing going on plugging along <laughs> so that brings us up to covid um I would wow. imagine that you've been gigging all along since you started this in 2012, did you say? 2011? Yeah, 12. Late, late 2011, I think, officially was our first show, yeah. Okay. And where Very. are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you feel that first time? You know, it just felt, it, it felt safe and comfortable because the people I was playing with were folks that I had jammed with. Um, and had known for years. So from yeah. that perspective, yeah. it felt good. Um, but I know there was a certain amount of, oh, holy crap, how do how are we gonna have enough you know, material to get through this time? But we did. Are, are you the only singer in the band? Are you the only one who um, sings? No, no, I make it a point to try to have folks in the band who can at the very least sing backup and hopefully can do a song or two so that yeah. so I think for, that makes it more interesting for the for the um, audience if we're doing a two or three yes. hour show. Yes. If we break it up where there's an instrumental in between or someone else sings one um, and it also gives me a break because uh, that can be a long time to sing. Um yeah. I don't have too many problems with vocal fatigue, but um, since, since we're talking about matured musicians, there yeah. are certain things that happen to women's voices as they uh, attain a certain age. Um, there, the, there are hormonal changes that affect the voice and you have to be aware of what those are and manage them. So uh, yeah, I have not lost any of my range yet. I have. I've lost a lot, but I don't care. <laughs> I like, yeah, I like yeah, the right. Things the bottom end, right? So that's all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Now, I noticed that my voice is considerably lower 
Um, yeah. I can hit lower notes that I can never hit before. And it's like, okay. <laughs> I, there's one musician out there who always calls me Joy Boy. I'm not sure what he means, but <laughs> I think I got a clue. <laughs> So yep. um, it it opens up it opens up, up some interesting some interesting things I think so it's it's okay. Are you doing this? Are you are you singing as full time? Is that your major? Um, job? No, no? Uh, I have a uh, a full time job um, in the world of communications in tech. Oh, so by which I mean. Uh, blogs and social media and and stuff like that yeah okay i i thought i, I thought you said something about that but uh yeah. i wasn't sure well that's too bad but you still play out quite a bit right what, what kind of places oh, yeah. do you play? what kind of places do you play in you know it's it's interesting i i feel like the roster of where we play wrote changes and evolves and mm -hmm. especially in the last two years um, mm -hmm. because venues have gone away or new venues come in who are, who are trying out live music. So mm -hmm. we do a really a variety. Like I said, on, on Saturday, we just did a show where we did a trio show and we did a couple of those last summer and those are really fun. And, you know, when you don't have the drums, you know, you, there's some material that doesn't work, but there's right. other material that just takes on a, a different, life almost um yes so it's kind of fun to explore that but then it's also fun to do the big bombastic you know the whole band um we played yeah. the south sound blues association holiday party yeah. Yeah. we almost had the full horn section we had uh trombone and or uh, we had not trombone we had sax and trumpet and so we had that big sound and it was just like you know in your face and loved it so it's a pretty wide variety. Um, so, you know, we will play anything from like a little coffee shop, um, which incidentally, when I first started um, kind of getting back into music, that's what I did. And those are great training, right? Because yes. I would do these, these four o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday shows, right? <laughs> and there'd be these people who were three feet away from me with their coffee. And they're so <laughs> listening to you. And Oh, and they're so intense and they're so wired and, and that, you know, if you can sing to somebody like that, you can kind of sing to anything. anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. Any, any, you know, and, and that was a little intimidating at first for, you know, someone who was used to playing, being in a choir and maybe um, being just out front in front of a choir, maybe for a solo or something like that to go to, I'm it in front of this band in this coffee shop with all these super caffeinated people three feet away from me. Um, and my way of dealing with that was I would just, um, and I, I learned this from Duffy Bishop and uh, who was in Portland at the time. And when I went to see her a couple of times um, is that I would first or second song, I would just go wade right out in the audience and I would start singing to them. And I'd be like, this, you're mine. This place is mine. <laughs> And then I would feel more comfortable about yeah. being out there, you know. Um, I'm not been able to do that. To work with that, but it worked well for me to take that approach. So anywhere, anything from a coffee shop to you know a bigger place like the Spanish Ballroom down in Tacoma. Um, we love the spa down in Tacoma as well, which is more intimate. But gosh, just great audiences there. Um, you know, the outdoor gigs, the festivals are a ton of fun because then you get people who love the blues um so i love it all i guess is my <laughs> i was never able to go out there by myself i'm so when you go on these uh, little coffee shops or people are so buzzed are you playing an instrument or, or are you just or is some you with somebody else playing an instrument or yeah Ah. Yeah, so it would be a you know a trio gig probably, oh, okay. or maybe a maybe with the drums, you know maybe okay. vocals, guitar, but maybe the guitarist is acoustic, and you know maybe the drummer is using his smaller kit. Yeah. So we do we do adjust not just the configuration of the band, but even what we play, depending on on the venue. Yeah, good. but I thought you said, I, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused here because I thought you said it was just you alone, uh, but. Oh, I, I mean, uh, me, when you're singing in a choir and you're with 10 or 20 or 30 people. Right. 
and your goal is to blend vocally right. versus you're the only singer and you're out front. Gotcha. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So during COVID, how did things change for you and how did you cope with uh, this whole change of being locked down and not being able to be out there and, <laughs> and she smiles. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I think like a lot of people, I was just like shocked and depressed and um, stunned and you know, everything else. So, I mean, of course I still had my job. So right. there was that, that was normal. And the, you know, the family was around and that was normal. Um, but, you know, uh, I derive a lot of my inspiration from just being around people and hearing what they say and interact with them. And I think, you know, my big exciting thing for a long time there was either going to the grocery store or going to the dump. You know, it's like, ooh, I'm going out. Should I change my T-shirt? You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Um and, um, and so I didn't, I, I think I wrote, you know, two songs in the space of like a, a year, whereas normally I'm kind of just writing and coming up with ideas all the time. Yeah. Um, I just yeah. wasn't getting any kind of inspiration or, or if I had written stuff, it would have been super depressing, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I should, I should say that um, when I was a little kid, writing stories, writing poems was really a way for me to process things. And it was yeah. my therapy. And now um, I still sometimes will write a poem or something like that or a story. Um, um, but a lot of times that turns into song lyrics. Um, <laughs> but I, it's, it's just funny. Like I'll hear, I'll hear a snippet of something that someone says in the grocery store yeah. and it will turn into a song. Yeah. Um, and it's just how my mind works or somebody in the band will say something and it'll just, it could be two words and I'll just be, I'll be off and running. Um, I'll, and so, yes, with COVID, you know, we had no gigs from, I think our last gig was right after Valentine's day, um, 2020. And then we did not gig again until end of June of 2021. Um, we did do some rehearsals just for our sanity and just so we could get together and, you know, we were masked. Um, and then as I felt like it was a good time to get back in, um, and you know, the, the members of the band were vaccinated and stuff like that. Then I was like, okay, let, we can start, you know, booking some shows. And so we started wading back into that in June, but it's a very different world. And it keeps changing seemingly week to week. Yeah. Yeah. Now with Omicron out there, um, it's kind of changing the, the the way everything is at the moment. And I know I went to a jam last night. Uh, Lynn Sorensen and Doug McGrew uh, have guest mm -hmm. players come into this little place called the Twin Dragon in Duval on Sunday nights from 7 to 11. And it's really, uh, you know, I worry about that with the people that are coming in there because they're not wearing face masks. I mean, you come in, you wear a face mask, but if you're playing pool and drinking, you don't have a face mask on. And, mm -hmm. you know, I certainly give a thought to that. I've had, you know, two shots on my booster, but that doesn't mean that I'm protected. I can still get it. And so, or spread it, yeah. which is even worse. So, yeah, I, this thought crossed my mind, and I have refused to put a van together because of that. I, I just didn't want to expose people, and a lot of people say, well, that's foolish. Well, maybe it is, but that's how I feel about it. It is definitely a threat, and I, I don't well, know anything. Know. That yeah, I think you're right. Good. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right to be concerned, and you may have seen – uh, pretty early on in COVID, there was a super spreader event, I think in Snohomish with a church choir that got together and rehearsed and they weren't yes. masked. Yes. And, and that. from that and from some other research came the thing that um, singers can put, you know, because we're, we're, we're putting a lot of air out there. Yes. Um, that, I need you know, we can, we can put air out. Yeah. And so that was a big concern for me. So that's why I'm vaccinated and boosted and um, I will wear my mask, you know, when I'm not on stage. Um, 
but you know if you know, if there's venues that are you know where the audience is closer i just hope that that they're being careful because i'm you know doing as as much as i can i think um you know one of the things that we always used to experience is we for several years we went down to the international blues competition down in memphis which is oh. a ton of fun um, and there are a lot of yeah, uh, it's usually the end of January. This year they've moved it to May. But um, uh, there's a ton of uh, open mic or, you know, uh, showcases and, uh, you know, jams and stuff that are part of that. And I always used to bring um, Clorox wipes with me because I wouldn't know who or how many people had been on a mic before me. And so I would Clorox wipe the crap out of the mic and the cord yeah. and even the stand um, because of every single year a bunch of people would come back with the flu mm. um, and it happened to me in 2020 actually I went to that competition and I came back and I got super sick and it was influenza right. A oh so um, yeah so I think yeah for for anything where people are sharing equipment and stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah, just bring your Clorox, bring your Clorox wipes. Um, I frequently will wipe my, even my equipment down after when we're packing up. Um, and, and one thing that I've seen is a lot of venues, uh, the ones that supply PA, for example, will, mm -hmm. um, ask singers to bring their own mic. Yeah. So that's their way of, of kind of helping to manage that. And so I'm like, I'm, which I'm more than happy to do. I have more than one mic. Um, and, but I'll still, even though it's mine, I will wipe it down and right. wipe down the board. I use those little covers. I have some little, I, mm -hmm. yeah, you probably saw those. I, I use those. I always put it over the mic before I start to sing. I don't know how safe they are, but I feel safe. So <laughs> I know my mouth is oh, in touch. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can't help it. Yeah, so even no matter how hard you try at some point, your mouth's going to bump that mic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've chipped a tooth doing that. Um, oh, no. <laughs> well, you just, you know, you're interacting with the audience and you're moving and bam, yeah. there it goes. Um, <laughs> I, I did hear somebody was telling a story. I saw them post on Facebook, I think, that they had been to a jam down in California and they were supplying each singer with a, a little, one of those little um, sleeves for the mic. And I was like, that's, that's a, not, a, not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah, they had those out at, um, oh, what's that called? The Buzz Inn in uh, Lake Stevens area. And That's they were, there was that S karaoke, but she makes everybody, she gives everybody a cover. And then, of course, that's your cover. Nobody uses it again. But yeah, I like that idea too. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, it is a lot pass before too long, and we won't have to be doing all this crazy stuff. <laughs> so, did you write? You didn't write many, like most people sat down like I did, picked up their guitar after about two weeks into COVID lockdown. I said, I'm going crazy. <laughs> so I took all my books out and got all my stuff together and started practicing and singing. And one thing led to another. And I met this Jessica Lynn Whitty and, and her husband, Raymond Hayden. And they told me that I should write. You know, I thought, right, mm -hmm. I've never you know so I started and that took up the rest of the time and then I started producing it and uh yeah I, I thought but on the other hand you found you know you're getting your inspiration from up from without uh, uh your your fans are and and people who listen to your music are giving you that inspiration now I haven't had it quite that way I have it in reverse <laughs> I have it upside down <laughs> But I think yeah. that was the the first time that I just really it there it was just so much changing and so much going on, um, you know, because uh, I have a, a son and yeah. he was in his senior year of high school. Um, he his school of course went remote, and then we were trying to figure out whether it was going to be remote for the rest of the year or not. Um, we moved in the middle of all this mess. So we moved in the spring of uh, 2020. So there's a lot going on and there, there was a lot just changing in the world. And I just went uh, internally, just, I went dark. 
I there yeah. were just I had I had I'm sure I had things to say, but I I wasn't writing I wasn't writing them down. It was it was um, yeah. a strange time. I was very relieved when I finally wrote a song um, at coming out of that. Yeah, that's good. At least you found it again. <laughs> at best, you you've exceeded at it. So, all right. Well, that brings me through COVID, but um, what it doesn't bring me through is you said you're working on an album and there's another album coming out. And yeah. I don't remember the date that you said it, but um, I kind of like to know what you're doing uh, with your music now <laughs> yeah. and where you're going so in the future. I... Um... There's one song um, that we released in October of last year as a single, just to kind of, you know, say, hey, we're still here. Um, and I have five songs in addition to that, that the band and I are working on right now. So in order to have an, an album, we need another yeah, three or four, maybe. So um, now that we've got our new guitarist on board and he's, he kind of had to spend some time learning the material, the existing material. So we're going to um, work on some, some more songs, get them, you know, try them out, get them out there. Um, actually, no, we have seven. We have two. We have the one we released in October. We have another one and then five beyond that. So yeah, we only need a couple more. Um, wow. But I, we don't have a date yet um, because we need to kind of one of the things that's really important, I find, is performing the songs live. They go through a certain evolution when you get them under your fingers, playing them live. Um, and it's fun to see people's reaction to them. And so they do develop. And it's so it's a good idea to kind of road test them. Mm -hmm. Um but once we've done that with the new songs, then we'll go into the studio and um, start recording. And then I'll have a better idea of when, when we're going to release it. Um, mm. But we're not going to be too far behind because in 2019, we were just, we were, I don't know. In 2019, we uh, went in, when we all went down to the International Blues Challenge in Memphis, um, in 2019 and we booked some time at royal studios which is where al green recorded all of his albums and it's an iconic studio and we recorded the majority of our heart of memphis album there in january of 2019 and then we released that album in june and then at the same time that we were recording that album and getting that done i was writing the songs for our christmas in blue album and of course, as it, people tell me this is normal, but it's hilarious, is that we're recording our Christmas album in summertime <laughs> and sweating. And you're sitting there singing about snowflakes and elves <laughs> and, you know, toys. And it, you're sweating and you can't even think about Christmas. But there you are. Yeah. Um, and then that album came out at the end of October 2019. So we released two albums in one year. And so, you know, not that not that bad, you know, especially with COVID that we'd probably be looking toward the end of this year when it would come out maybe, you know, late fall. Okay. So that's well, you the should... scoop. That it goes. I, I'm going to ask you to post more often on Mature Musician's site and let us know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. so I can that, do that. I can do that. All right. Especially gigs, because that's a good way for people to go out and hear you and, and you know, it, it, it listen to, to something that you may be putting in an album that they like and they want to keep, something that they've heard mm -hmm. and they want to treasure. So I, I do think that concept, of yours is, you know, Jessica does this too. I haven't done it yet, but re uh, testing the song on the audience before you produce it, that's something new to me. Um, yeah. Have you ever done it any other way and then just decided that this works or can you be a little more specific on how that, how that all comes about? Well, you know, like the Christmas songs because of the timing. Yeah. yeah, we did not perform them live um, before the album came out. 
-hmm. And so what ends up happening with that is of course, those are, um, I was going for, for like, I grew up listening to, you know, like the Bing Crosby Christmas and the the Elvis Christmas and stuff like that. (laughs) And so I, um, I, a lot, like one of the sound songs intentionally sounds like an El- like a song Elvis might have done. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they, they do have kind of a retro feel to them on purpose, but they have, um, more complex arrangements and they have a full horn section. So when we play them live, what we do is we simplify so they sound different live than they do on the album. So that's kind of where where the difference might lie is you find out when you play something live that something just doesn't work. Um, people keep forgetting that, you know, that there's this chord change or, you know, it, it's some part of it that's just yeah. too complex. So yeah. then you're like, OK, um, we, we, we need to fix that. Um, so we went the opposite way with the Christmas Christmas album, you know, the, the arrangements are wonderful. And um, our I give our keyboard player, Brian Ohlendorf, full credit for that. He worked with me really closely on the arrangements, um, especially the horn parts. And so, but that requires a certain amount of precision that when you're going then to play live, unless you want to do like a ton of rehearsals, which nobody wants to do. <laughs> at least no, no one has no one has time for that um yeah so we we uh we ended up for this last holiday season simple taking a couple of the songs and simplifying them um especially because we had to use subs on a couple of gigs and so just having to you know communicate so we'd say okay we're doing here's what we're doing this differently you know from the uh recorded version and that worked fine um but yeah, you just you you get a you get a sense for what people are responding to. Does the song need to be faster? Um, do you need to do something different with the intro? Um, you know, just different things like that. And so you refine it um, as as you yeah. play it live. Thank you for that. I I I, uh, I I'm finding that I don't do my songs live because they're so different than what's been recorded. And they just kind of seem to me kind of flat. I mean, kind of blah. <laughs> and so, and without the backup vocals and the the, the guitar licks that um, uh, Chad Chris does, it, it just doesn't, this doesn't work. And I'm not mm. sure how to correct that. So I, I haven't, um, I have a mess with them and I, I, I regret that because I know I've got to do something. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with having a recorded version and a, the way you do it live. Um, uh-huh. For instance. So for instance, we have this song that's on our first album and on the first and on the album, it has a fairly simple ending, but it's a song that people love to dance to. Ah. Well, you know, if you got people dancing, you keep yeah. playing. So we end up, you know, for, for this, this particular song lends itself well to the end of a, end of a night. Um, and so what we do is we do this big, like gospel style ending. If you think of like James Brown and the blues brothers, yeah. that whole scene that he has in the blues. So we do this big gospel ending and yeah. people love it. They go absolutely nuts. But we didn't do it on the recording. I don't, if, yeah. if we were to record it again, maybe we would. But um, if that's something that we discovered and just stumbled upon through listening to people, um, you know, or through watching people react to it. So uh-huh. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I I now I've got a whole new direction. <laughs> I got some ideas yeah. here. Thank you. I I wondered about that. And I, I'm not the one, I'm not one like Jessica can, can get on a stage with her guitar and sing and play and be perfectly comfortable. Doesn't matter to her. But to me, to be all by myself up on that stage, I'm like, ah, <laughs> I don't want to do this. And there's a place, I don't know if you've ever been to it. I haven't been back to Snohomish because of all that, all that. COVID there and they had 
my husband works for health care and they get reports every week and they were telling which mm -hmm. places had the most COVID and that was one of them. And uh, so I haven't been back there, but um, they have a place called the Oxford Saloon. I don't know if you've ever played there or not, but um, I have a, a huge love of the Oxford. That and the Raging River were like the two places yeah. that I used to uh, go cool. and sing at and really learn, you know, the things that have served me so well now that I've, you know, had my band. So, yeah, yeah. I love the Oxford. Yeah. Well, there's a guy out there on uh, Jerry Batista. I don't know if you know him or not, but uh, he know. does a Tuesday jam. He's a really good player. Uh, but anyway, he, he has a jam. And I said, <laughs> I texted him. I said, Jerry, <laughs> would you come out on that stage with me? <laughs> and he's, you know, he's more rock than he is country. But there are no way I could have gotten up there by myself. And of course, he didn't know the song. But he, he he's yeah. a professional enough to know what to do to, to accompany me. <laughs> yeah. So, I think. I think one of the best things, you know, one of the things that I did, of course, having my piano background. Oh, sorry about barking dogs. Um, because of my piano background, I can explain chords and stuff to people. Um, I actually did a little bit of studying on drums and drum theory so that I could talk to drummers about, like, this is the kind of, you know, feel that we're looking for. So I did a lot of, of stuff so that I could communicate well to people in jams. Um, yeah. and I think that helps. Um, but you know, there's this joke that, um, that is actually not, not inaccurate entirely depends on the person, but that, you know, if you really want to freak out a guitar player, show them a chart. Um, so, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> I have those, <laughs> they don't even look at them. There are people who show up at jams and bring charts and there are brave souls who are willing to do it. So good on them, you know. Tommy Wall was one of them. He, he managed to get through it. I don't know. It's amazing. But yeah, uh, I guess um, one of the things that I still have in mind, your dog is guarding you there, <laughs> um, is during this, during this whole career that, you know, that, going to jams and, and creating your own music and putting your own band together. Thinking back on all of it, do you, is there anything that stood out to you as like an aha moment? Was there anything that you said, oh my God, I can't believe you're really doing this? Or was it a bunch of um, moments? Like that? It's a bunch of things. I think, um, but a, a big one is to me when I have a song and someone comes up to me and says that it, that they could relate to it, that it meant something to them. So um, for example, my, uh, both Patrick's mom and my mom had Alzheimer's oh, um, yeah. and uh, I wrote a song about Alzheimer's and um we haven't performed it live for a while, but when we did, we would every single time, at least one person would come up and say, yes, thank you for writing this, um, including people who were nurses for Alzheimer's patients who would say, yes, th thank you. Um, this resonated with me. Or I have a song I wrote super early on with the band called Hey Bully. And it's a, you know, it's an anti-bullying kind of song. And I will get kids coming up to me saying, thank you for that song. So, um, you know, like I said, my writing and my music a lot of times is, is therapy for me. It's my way of working through things. And so right. an aha moment for me was really realizing that it meant something to other people too. And it was helping them too. So when they say music heals, they are not kidding. Yeah. I put that, I put a notice out that there was two hours before you were going to interview with us. And there was, I put this little picture on there about music and what it can do, it, it, you know, that it actually heals people um, in the brain and even people with Alzheimer's. And I have, I belong to the North Shore um, band and we have like 12 different people playing all kinds of different music and instruments and go into um, senior centers, et cetera, and play to these guests. And uh, 
it's just amazing when you see some of these patients that are people that have Alzheimer's or senility come alive. I mean, come alive. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most incredible yeah. thing to watch. Um, yeah. It, it's yeah. One of the one of the coolest moments we had fairly early on in the band was we played at the um, assisted living facility where my parents were oh. in, in uh, fall of 2014. And my mom was pretty well into her Alzheimer's at that point, but my dad was still very lucid and he was so incredibly proud that we were playing and he was telling everyone that's my daughter up there and and it was it was very cool and um he actually passed away suddenly and unexpectedly about a month after that I'm so sorry. it was a wonderful thing thank you it was a wonderful thing that he got to hear um hear the band and see the band um before before he passed and he was just right. like i said so proud um but it was also fun to see how those folks were were responding to the music yes yes absolutely my mother died of alzheimer's and my sister moved her here to washington my husband was in the military and so we were out <laughs> catting and fought all over the world but um yeah yeah, yeah. she did remember me when i finally got here now back in the states, and um, it's a it is it is the worst kind of death. You know, little by little bits and pieces of a person go away. And I, I feel like it's worse for the their loved ones because probably, the person yeah. After, yeah, yeah, they're not aware. The person after <laughs> is yeah they're not aware of what's going on um they're confused and upset often and i'm sure that is hard but it's harder yeah. i think for the families to to remember this person and remember who they were yes. and and they don't remember that and they don't remember you and and they might even like i there were situations where my mother didn't want to see me she didn't want because she didn't remember me so she's like who's that um <laughs> And you just have to sort of roll with it, right? Because you don't want her to be upset. So you just kind of go, okay, this is not a good time to visit, you know. But then 20 minutes later, it could be completely different. Right. Um, yeah. so that, I think nine, that, that for me was the tough, was the tough thing. Yeah. Yeah. Nine months before my mother died, uh, she and she didn't want to be kept alive. So she start, basically starved to death. But uh, she told me, don't come back. It's not worth it. And I'll tell you what, I, I went through a really dark period. I <laughs> really dark. And, and yeah. And uh, when, I, when I see the hope today in music for people uh, in my mom's position and the fact that it tweaks something in their memory and it opens mm -hmm. up a door that's been closed, it's just amazing. So I'm glad you wrote that song and I appreciate it. I'm sure... Those people telling you that they appreciated it were right on the money. Yeah. So there's just about a few minutes. We have about four four minutes, uh, and there are people on you know, singer songwriters like yourself and uh, listening to this program. They may not be right now at the, this particular moment, but this goes. I posted on uh, Facebook after we're through. It's not live, but they can still hear it all. And then about a week later, I put it on YouTube on my channel mm -hmm. so that those are there and, and people respond to that as well. So when they go in and, and I got a tag on there and they put your name in there, it'll pop up. So if they want to watch it, they can. Ooh. So in the closing of, of all of this and directing this to senior songwriters and some of them are just beginning and putting out their first album like i am hopefully this spring sometime uh, do you have any thoughts or any advice considering your journey that you'd like to share with us just keep trying <laughs> um or do you know how you discouraging know, it can if be I, if, I look at the, if i look at the progression of our albums it's you know i can see myself learning I can see my skills as a songwriter, as a singer, as a band leader improving. So, you know, there's, so just keep trying, keep writing, revising, um, 
sometimes, you know, you might write 20 songs and only two of them are ones you want to record. That's okay. You learn. Um, we went to the Van Gogh exhibit uh, down in Seattle. And that was one of the things that he said was that, you know, you know, you might do a whole bunch of drawings or have a whole bunch of ideas that don't pan out, but they will lead to the things that do. So, you know, keep learning, keep trying. Um, and, you know, just be willing to learn and evolve and, uh, and grow because that's, that's fun. Um, yeah. And that's a fun it, part. It, it, yeah. absolutely, it absolutely is fun. And, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's fun to look back. We sometimes will go back to a song that we you had on an old album and see if we can do a different take on it. So, um, it's a blast. So yeah. It, and please keep creating because the world needs more art. <laughs> exactly. Especially now. <laughs> Especially now. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've totally enjoyed yes. you. I totally enjoyed you, uh, Michelle Demore. Anymore. I do. Um, is that French? Is that name French? Yes, my family. My family um, was from my both my parents were from Quebec. So yeah. Okay. So I thought so. And my husband, uh, my last name now is Lagerie. His dad was from uh, France, and he couldn't support ten kids <laughs> on art, yeah. and he was an artist there, <laughs> so he became a tattoo artist. <laughs> Way back, he's been dead for many years now. But yes, art, even on your own body, wow. is you keep creating. <laughs> so absolutely, I really enjoyed. Uh, I'm so glad you came on, and I'm so glad that people got to meet you today, Michelle, and do more. Yeah. And I do. That see was you that was a ton of a ton of fun to meet you as well. And I hope <laughs> I get to meet you in person before too long. Amen. <laughs> Me too. I got a lot of people to meet. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, keep, us no posted. keep us posted. Yep. I want to make sure that I keep up on your albums and mm -hmm. your gigs. And I'm sure other people who are listening today will love it. And we have um, one more last parting comment here. It says, Tommy here, great interview. So I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what to say, Tommy. Well, he's, Tommy well, he's probably <laughs> just glad I didn't tell any stories about him. <laughs> oh really? I'm gonna have to have you back to finish that one. <laughs> all right, Michelle. They're all good. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I hope your son feels better. And we'll oh, see you in the you. future. And I'll be waiting to hear from you. All right. All right. Bye bye. Thanks everybody for listening today and enjoying our guest. And um, next Tuesday. I mean, sorry, Monday at two o'clock, we have Ronnie Lee. Yeah, if you've ever heard Ronnie Lee play, play Michelle, uh, she's, a, she's a rock artist, and uh, I think you might enjoy her. But anyway, everybody, have Ronnie a good Lee. day. Yeah. Sign off. All right. Bye. All right. All right. All right. Uh -huh.